Okay, everyone, um, good afternoon. I'm Sharon Milgram. I hope you're all doing okay. Uh, let me see if I can get my camera on here. It is an incredibly sunny day here in the DC area. Hopefully uh, it is wherever you are and I hope you get a chance uh, to just spend a little bit of time uh, outside, maybe right when we're done, um, get up and stretch your legs and, and get outside. It uh, certainly gets dark early. And I think that um, it's gonna be increasingly important that we all take time uh, during the day to, to be in the sun a bit. So I'm gonna talk today about preparing for virtual graduate school interviews. A few details, the handouts are already in the uh, handout box here in GoToWebinar. You can download it. We will also uh, email that out to you um, either uh, later today or first thing tomorrow. If you have an issue suddenly with the sound or the slides don't advance, that is nearly always solved by uh, quitting the program and rejoining us. There'll be a tape, so if you miss a little bit, no big deal. You can go back to the exact same link and um, rewatch it, and in a few days, it'll be uh, closed captioned and added to our YouTube page so you can watch it later as you're trying to uh, prepare. So let's go ahead then, and I, what I wanna do is start um, with a question. And you're gonna just type in to the question box the first word that comes to mind when you hear me say the word interview. So just go ahead and tell me the first word or maybe two words that come to mind. So go ahead and type it into the question box now. Communication, opportunity, interaction, stress, information, stress, questions, stressful, nerves, failure, what's your strength, experience. Ah, <laughs> nervous, anxiety, love, questions, relationships, right? Fun, wow, live stream, exams, experience. I wonder if those two going together are a worry about I'm still in school and now I'm going to be virtually interviewing, so I probably expect it at school. Difficult, stress, anxiety, stress. And you know, if I could build a word cloud from all of that, it would look something like this, all right? Stress and anxiety, two of the most common words. A few of you put in things like opportunity and chance, right? Something positive, right? And, and we do see some positive words. In the last time I did this in real time, the ah, which we saw today, came out overwhelmed, preparation, nervous terror i mean look at this and my goal today is twofold the first is to say the fact that that stress is one of the most common words or the most common word makes a lot of sense all right and in fact the key takeaway of all of this today is if we talk about all of this if you internalize the messages if you prepare and practice, then you can turn the interviews into an opportunity, into some of those positive words here, connection, networking. You have the potential through your preparation and your thoughtful way of approaching this to really have a positive experience. Probably the key takeaway of today and really in many ways the key takeaway of how we deal with stress beyond this experience is that we focus on what we can control. There's a whole lot of things in terms of this, the whole pandemic, in terms of the interviewing for graduate school in the middle of a pandemic. There's a whole lot of things that you cannot control. The timing of a vaccine, whether schools will be able to offer you a chance to visit before you have to make a decision, whether your computer will work flawlessly during the interview or not, you can't control those things. Where we find stress is in the things we wish to control that we can't control. 
The human brain does not like uncertainty at all. And we run through these scenarios in our head of how we can control that uncertainty and we can't. There are so many things we can't control that we wish to control. That's where a lot of stress comes in. How we deal with that stress is by focusing on what we can control. And the honest truth is that through preparation and practice and really thoughtful approaches to interviewing, you really can control elements of it. And that can help decrease your stress. So I just want to stress, <laughs> I just want to say that stress is completely normal. Feeling stressed about this is okay for now. It is really the appropriate response. The stakes are very, very high. Stress is helpful or potentially helpful if we put our discomfort and fears into perspective and somebody put into the chat, the word that comes to mind is imposter fears. They put imposter syndrome. I'll just keep using imposter fears. I really prefer that language for all the reasons I've talked about in the past in resilience workshops, right? So if we put our imposter fears into perspective, if we put all of our discomforts and worries into perspective, and we use this stress and anxiety now as a warning sign to develop strategies and to practice, then being stressed right now is adaptive. When stress becomes maladaptive or unhealthy is when we allow it to drive our behaviors and then it tends to drive negative behaviors like ignoring practice sessions, like um, avoiding emails, avoiding dealing with the issues. So it's okay to feel stressed right now. We're gonna use that stress to go through a way of really preparing. And I'm going to help with that today in a couple of ways. The first is I'm going to give you an insider view of this process. I'm going to tell you what the program directors on the other side are worried about and what they're thinking about. I'm also going to try to answer as many questions as I possibly can. If I can't answer all of them today or an answer, a question comes up in your mind next week, you can always reach out. There are many resources if you're at NIH resources here through OITE. If you're somewhere else, hopefully resources at your school, but you can always reach out to us if you have questions. So we're going to try to get as many questions as possible answered. I'm going to remind you about resources that might be helpful, right? And, and you're going to use those resources throughout. But this discussion starts with stress management, because if we can't control our stress, we can't focus. If we want to be our most creative problem solving self, we have to manage our stress and anxiety. So we're going to start with what to do now, way in advance of interviews. And the first thing is to be proactive and address elements of the virtual format. All right. You want to start thinking about that now. Like today, as I sat down to do this, I realized all week I've been struggling with late afternoon sun in my office, it's distracting to me, it gets in my eyes, it shines on the screen, I did nothing about it, right? What you want to do now is be really proactive. You want to spend time now in the space where you'll be interviewing, and you want to make sure it works well for you. You'll find a quiet and professional space, one that doesn't have a lot of distractions, one that has the best Wi-Fi you can find, right? If you start now, by the time you get close to your interviews, you'll be comfortable in that space. You'll know that it works um, for you. You'll, you'll be best able to uh, feel good about the virtual format. And let's be honest, the we've been on Zoom a lot since March, so we're all pretty comfortable with virtual formats, but there's some loss in not being able to get on a plane and go to places. So we have to acknowledge that loss while still working within the confines that we have. It will help a lot if you download any software required, update to the latest version if they're using Zoom um, and you already have it and you test everything in advance a couple of times. You will wanna think about lighting, your background, the height of your computer so that you're clearly visible, that you're framed appropriately. You'll want to practice and time things in various lighting so that you'll be set up with extra lights if necessary. You'll have a book for your laptop if necessary. 
anything that you can do to know that the whole system is working. It will decrease your stress if you practice your virtual handshake and asking answering interview questions online now. So I know we've been on Zoom and we've done a lot of things on Zoom, but I don't think most of you have interviewed yet on Zoom. And so you'll wanna get used to that. By virtual handshake, I mean, what will happen in the first minute, right? When you come on and they come on, right? You don't want that first minute to be you with your phone uh, or you quickly scrambling and pulling things. You want to be ready to be sitting in a calm, uh, uh, you know, not slouched way, not leaning against uh, the bed, not, you know, not uh, being disorganized. And then you want to have uh, this experience of a virtual handshake. You lean forward, put your hands out. Nice to meet you. I'm Sharon Milgram. Okay, so you want to practice that so it doesn't feel fake. You also want to practice asking and answering interview questions online. I think that uh, online with video is much better by the than the phone, but it's still always hard to know when is the other person finished. There's something about uh, being on. Um, on Zoom that makes that a little bit harder than in the room. So you'll wanna practice pausing but not pausing too long and then starting. You'll wanna practice uh, if someone interrupts you, how you're gonna deal with that. So you wanna be practicing online as much as possible. I also think you wanna normalize the experience of social activities on Zoom. And I know you've done that plenty, right? We've all been on Zoom doing social stuff for now many, many months. But this is really a difference because it's an interview. So you'll be with uh, faculty or students, other applicants, a mix, and you'll be in these discussions and you'll want to practice both speaking up, but also not speaking up too much or what I like to call stepping down and how you'll engage in group discussions. If they say, please turn on your mic and ask your question, you'll want to be able to do that. And the way to do that is to practice now and feel good about that. So many trainees join our different groups with their cameras off, uh, putting things into the chat. And you don't want that to be your way of engaging and showing up in an interview. So if you're at NIH, I would sign up now for some of the drop-in groups, go to some of the trainee social activities and just get used to um, doing all of this via Zoom. You'll want to plan things out, have a notepad, snacks, water, everything sorted out and set up in advance. You want all of that, not the day before, but a little care kit as you set up early. And you want to pick out your clothes in advance, have them ready. And whatever you do, do not do the cool thing of a nice interview shirt on top and pajamas or shorts on the bottom. Um, event, uh, inevitably, people stand up, and uh, while it may seem funny in the minute, and it certainly is funny on Instagram and uh, in uh, blooper reels uh, on TikTok, it isn't really, uh, doesn't convey a real serious concern for the interview process in person. So these are a lot of things uh, to do about the virtual format. I mentioned these first, not because I think you have to do these first. In many, many ways, some of these you can do, you know, getting your snacks, water, et cetera, sorted out, you can do the week before. But I mentioned it first because I think that the idea of virtual interviews and how to wrap your head around them is probably taking a fair amount of stressful space in your head. I like to think of our brain power as sort of a, a, a pie. And if half of our pie is going to worrying, we don't have a whole lot of slices left to enjoy. And I'm concerned that a whole bunch of your brain space right now is tied up in worries about the virtual format. So these are a lot of little do's and don'ts, things that you need to worry about now, things that you can put away until after the new year when you have your interview schedule set up. 
but I want to talk about other things that you can do to calm your stress in advance. And this one does really need to start now. And I should probably have started with this one, but I flipped it because I know the word virtual interview is in everybody's mind. And that is that starting now, you can focus on your wellness and resilience, right? All of us or many of us are having trouble with getting a good night's sleep. You know, there's only so many COVID meals we can enjoy preparing, but we know that nutrition and sleep are key elements of our ability to manage our stress. We want to take a hard look at our use of stimulants and depressants, uh, of anything that we do in the realm of addictive behaviors that are sucking up energy and draining us. On uh, the 1st or 2nd of November, I can't remember the date, um, it's the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. We will have a special wellness and mental health webinar on numbing out and the use of um, addictive agents uh, for dealing with COVID stress. And so realistically, um, if that's a struggle, uh, you want to reach out now and get some support. Science has always told us about the benefit of exercise, but more so during the pandemic, we're seeing that people who have found a way to keep moving are doing better mental health wise and stress management wise. So get moving now. That's why I made those comments about the sunshine. I have my tennis racket sitting in the corner and um, I didn't get out long enough this morning. So as soon as I get off this webinar, I'm gonna get onto the courts for a little while and you need to find whatever it is that helps you get moving. <clears throat> if you practice mindfulness or think mindfulness might help, now is a good time to learn about it. We have drop-in meditation groups three times a week. If you're not at NIH and you wanna join those groups, just send me an email. Um, this is a great way to calm ourselves in the moment. Just saying the word mindfulness reminds me to sit up and take a deep breath. And in the moment, after a long time on Zoom, when you're a little worried about how things go, that ability to be mindful in the moment and to center yourself could be very helpful. You wanna start thinking about ne your negative self-talk and your imposter fears now. You want strategies for dealing with them. I think this week is a drop-in group on cognitive distortions and imposter fears. If this is something that you really struggle with, now's the time to think about it. As part of the resilience series, which I hope many of you are doing, uh, the data from the summer shows us that this really does change people's attitudes about themselves and work. If you are participating, you've already heard the unit on negative self-talk and imposter fears, but if you're not participating, you could right now go uh, to YouTube and watch it. I find that negative self-talk and imposter fears are one of the things that really get in the way of people interviewing effectively. And I also know that with help strategies, um, these can really be put into perspective and minimized. And so I want to encourage you, if that's an issue, to reach out uh, and get some support. And if you are struggling with COVID stress, uh, with uh, if social anxiety is something that uh, is generally a struggle for you, if you are feeling really um, in a tight, hard spot about all of the mess of the pandemic and interviewing in the midst of the pandemic, now is the time to reach out for support so that you already have, have a support system and a wellness practice in place before the interview. A lot of interview strategy is controlling the stress in the moment, but you can't control the stress in the moment unless you have a plan in advance. The third thing for calming your stress in advance is talking with your PI and other mentors now. You wanna be talking with them about the science that you are doing, right? So that you can answer questions, so that you can uh, if somebody says, what are you going to do next, that you've thought that through, that you've had a reality check, that you make sure you understand both the big picture and the details. So you want to be talking with them about science. You also want to be talking to them about other science you wrote about in your application. 
because if you wrote about it in your application, it is fair game. People can ask you about it. And if you haven't talked about it for two years because it was a summer project after your junior year in college, people ask you for a question about it. It's not going to come fluently. It's not going to roll off. So you have to be talking about both your current science and other science. I'm going to give you a long list of interview questions that you should be practicing with each other, with mentors. Uh, if you're at NIH, you can practice in our small group uh, practice sessions. So, so you want to talk about science that you're doing now, science you've done in the past, maybe even science you wish to do in the future. And then you need to have a hard discussion. Hopefully it won't be hard, but I know for many postbacs, just bringing it up is difficult. You're going to need to have a discussion about time off for the interviews. What you do not want to do is juggle work and school and the interview. Oh, I have an hour break. I'm going to run to lab and wash a block. I'm going to run down to the animal quarters and count up the cages. I told my PI I would do that. I have, I'm going to go to class, and then I'm going to leave and do an interview. You want the day dedicated to the interview. You should imagine that you are going away for an interview, and your entire day should be about that interview. If it's difficult for you to imagine having this conversation, you can join us in December. The topic of the resilience uh, discussion series is assertiveness. I will lecture the second week of December and we will have drop in discussion groups on being assertive uh, the following week. But it's, it's definitely something that you need to think about. You want to really have some dedicated free time. Now, the fourth thing to calm your stress in thinking about this in advance is to be thoughtful as you accept interviews, uh, in, as you accept invitations to interview, right? And, and your interview schedule. I'm sorry for the typo there. My feeling is that whenever possible, you should schedule interviews so that you have at least one day in between. That will allow you to collect yourself, attend to work, attend to life. Uh, meet other responsibilities. When people were flying all over the country to interview, I would say, well, of course, if you're in Bethesda and you're going to fly out to California or you're in Montana and you're going to fly out to the East Coast, it makes sense to put them all together, chain them together and spend less time in airplanes. So usually I would encourage people, sure, do Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? That's a great idea. Or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Monday, right? But now um, I think I re I, for this particular scenario of virtual interviews, want to rethink that advice. And I think a day off in between, if you can manage it, will be very, very helpful. I think it will give you a chance to not be on Zoom quite as much. It will give you a chance to uh, move around a little bit more. I just think everything about a break is a good idea. I'm concerned, and we're still hearing about the structure of interviews, but I'm concerned that it's going to be some super long days in front of Zoom. And I'm, I know that we've all been doing that, but we also know that it takes some toll and can be pretty exhausting. And then the fifth thing to calm your stress is to use resources to prepare. Career counselors here at NIH or at your school, wellness advisors and wellness activities here at NIH or at your school if you're watching from outside NIH. And I want to remind you that we have a lot of webinars on the NIH OITE YouTube channel on stress management, on, on resilience. Especially the imposter fears and other cognitive distortions one, I think that's really important. But I think the general introduction and a discuss the discussion of wellness is important as well. And if you're not sure which ones to watch, just send me an email. There are a few on COVID stress that were made a long time ago that I think might be a nice reminder. I think that um, we have to like, I mean, I know we've had multiple waves of adjustment over since March over the last eight months. But I think entering this COVID winter is another big adjustment. And some of the general reminders of deep breathing exercises that can help, of ways to set healthy boundaries between work and home, I think some of those could be really helpful. So five key things 
to calm your stress in advance. So I'm going to pause here and take questions just about this material. Don't ask me questions about uh, how do I work out my schedule or what questions might I get because I'm going to address those in the next unit. But I want to pause here to see if there are any questions about this section. I'm going to step away from the camera for one minute while you type in your questions um, so that I can get a glass of water. All right, any questions about this part? All right, if not, I'm going to go on. Uh, here we go. Advice, uh, all of the things about if you're interviewing in a particular specialty, um, I will address in the interview uh, section later. The recentering yourself after a mistake or blooper uh, during the interview process, I actually thank you. That's a great segue to the next section. One of the reasons why I start with behaviors in advance is if you've practiced and learned how to talk to your negative self-talk in the interview when you have a blooper, right? and we all do, right? you are skilled at saying, okay, that was just one question with one interviewer. I need to let go of it and move on. Or if you practice using deep breathing to calm yourself, then in the interview, you can do the same. So that's why I lead with this. The strategies that you learn in advance, the deep breathing, the centering yourself, the having all this practice uh, in advance gives you confidence, learning how to control your cognitive distortions in the moment, all of those are the strategies you'll use in the moment, okay? That's why I spend so much time on this in advance stuff. If you think about it, it's sort of crazy. We're talking about interviewing and I'm talking about learning mindfulness. But the connection is whenever we are in a stressful situation, the more skills of stress management that we bring into the situation, the more likely it is that we will thrive in that situation. There's a question about uh, scheduling, and I'll address that uh, later. All right, so we're getting into questions about the future. So it's interesting, I'll just point out in terms of stress management, all of your minds are already racing ahead. Come on, Sharon, get into how do I schedule these? Get into what if there's a conflict, right? Your minds are already uh, racing to the next stressful part of this. So let me take you there, and I'll answer those questions. All right, now, that's all in advance. What about the day of? So the first is that you wanna really focus on your wellness strategy uh, that week leading up to it and the day, you know, the days before. You wanna have a sleep schedule that week and stick to it. You want to plan out some healthy eating meals and stick to it. And the day of, you wanna get up early, take a walk, work out, journal, meditate, do yoga, whatever it is you have decided are your best calming strategies. You know, on days that I have a really big presentation that I'm worried about, not with you guys, these I look forward to, but sometimes I have to present to leadership or people who are evaluating me. Those days, I always get up a little bit early, about 20 minutes before normal, so I can just sit quietly and collect myself. I might journal, I might just sit in the yard and watch the birds, I might just uh, take the dog for a really slow stroll, just 20 minutes to center myself, and then I exercise. That's what I mean here. Whatever your go-to strategy is on a tough day, you get up and do that. All right, then, the second thing for calming your stress that day is have in mind a supporter or two that you can reach out to if you hit a tough spot, right? So some people who know, hey, I might be texting you and I just need to vent and I need you to tell me, take a deep breath, you got this. So a supporter, right? I used to tell people, 
uh, when, the, when they were traveling, you know, you'll in between, you can stop in the restroom and you can send it, hey, I just had a really rough interview. I could use a kind word, all right? That's another thing about calming your stress in the moment. The third is that ability to pause, take a deep breath and refocus. I want to stress that that's about answering questions, but also you are not responsible for the technology and you will get kicked out of a meeting room. There will suddenly be freezing. That's why I want you to test all of that to minimize that chance. But even if you are incredibly careful, even if you have a backup laptop, even if you have practiced and tested and practiced and tested some more, the day of, there could be a storm. The day of, there could be some problem on the, uh, you know, on the NIH network. There could be a problem on the school's network. You're not responsible for the technology. And if you get too flustered by either the technology or a question that doesn't go well, you won't be able to bring yourself back to uh, a successful focused moment. And then two other things. One is to remember everyone else is nervous too, and everyone who's interviewing you is nervous. We have not done as many interviews remotely as we will be trying to do this year. We appreciate how hard the last eight months have been for all of you. The last eight months have been very, very hard for many of the people who are interviewing you. Some will have their kids doing Zoom school in the background. Some will be uh, you know, struggling themselves with technology. I think you have to be incredibly kind to both yourself and others in this case. And just remember, everyone is nervous and everyone is struggling. And here's the other thing I should put on here. Everyone is rooting for you, all right? We know it takes a lot of courage to apply to graduate school in the middle of a global pandemic. And we know that, all right? So everyone is nervous and everyone is rooting for you. And then I want you to learn now and leading up to your interviews, how to talk kindly back to your negative thoughts. Oh, everybody else is better prepared than me, right? And you need to learn how to say, actually everyone comes to this like me, prepared and not as well prepared. I'm gonna be okay. All right, so you wanna learn how to talk back to your negative self-talk. Those are some things about calming your stress in the moment. A lot of the rest of calming your stress is really understanding what to expect. So there's a couple more questions. Let me see uh, uh, if any of them apply, and they do. Thank you for clarifying, Hannah. Uh, your question. Um, so one of the things that I think is hard, the question is about what if you're the only trainee in your group applying in a certain area, and I assume that means then how do I practice, right? Because the interview questions will be different, uh, maybe the format of the interviews will be different. So I think I'm going to have, I'm going to say two things. One is about joining groups and how similar interviews are and the other is about stepping back and thinking about how how your interview is different i think all of you will benefit from answering general interview questions together with people in your group uh, even if they're not experts did i make sense did i ramble was i clear did i make eye contact across zoom which means by the way looking at the camera and not at uh, the person's face on the screen. So one of the strategies I use when I am meeting with people is I minimize them because then I'm not, I can't look at them. They're way off in the corner and then I can look at the green light on my camera and I tend then to do better about making eye contact. So I think you should see some of the universal uh, elements of an interview, talking about my research, talking about my career goals, talking about why I'm interested in this school or that school. So you should join groups even when your research, your, your um, area that you're heading towards is different. And then you should sit 
every one of you and say, what's different about my experience? What's different about what I'm doing? And then you want to do your best to find some people within that field, right? Or to find advice from people who are good, broad general uh, generalists, like career counselors, people in the OITE, people in your uh, undergraduate uh, career offices. And then you want to talk about the unique things, right? So that you're not just doing general things with people who don't know a lot about what you're heading to do, but you're also doing some things very unique to you. All right, so that's the last question before we dive into the details. All right, so what will the inter interview process be like? I just got off the uh, Zoom before I came here with my boss, Dr. Gottesman, who's the deputy director for intramural research, and we were talking about the summer program and how many unknowns there are about the summer program. I think it is exactly the same for these virtual interviews. There are a lot of unknowns. Schools are starting to put up online their formats and what they anticipate doing, but there are some unknowns. One of the key skills of resilience in graduate school is dealing with uncertainty. So view this as preparation um, and just do your best to calmly breathe into this. If a school says we're gonna post more information in January, don't obsessively look three times a day. It just drives anxiety. Mark down, this school's gonna post information in January. I think that um, we will start to see more and more about formats. Something that I wanna share with you that I hope will calm your nerves a little bit is that on our side, we are teaching people how to interview students effectively, how to use Zoom with, it, with, with uh, applicants in positive ways. So this is a learning experience for you and we are learning on the other side with the hope of making this really, um, really go well for you. And we can say because applicants to medical school and some other professional programs are earlier, right? Their cycle starts earlier, that a lot of our trainees are having positive experiences really able to talk and connect. And so accept that there will be some unknowns, check the websites for the programs, and then if they send you emails and tip sheets and FAQs or frequently asked questions, read them really carefully. That will be the details for that school. I was at a meeting last week and I thought I read pretty carefully, but clearly not carefully enough, and I finished the end of my talk and I said, okay, I'll take questions now. And there were absolutely no questions. And somebody had texted me and said, oh, there's 500, 400 some people here. I'm like, surely there's going to be some questions. I missed that the questions were going to come via uh, this other platform on my phone, not right in Zoom on my laptop. And you don't want to be caught like that. So you want to read all the information carefully, highlight it, take notes, have a notebook where you have each school, a, a tab on each school, right? get organized now, um, and you'll put in information on their virtual interviews there. I think some components you're likely to see, I think there'll be lots of virtual campus tours. I know we'll be on campus soon shooting our virtual campus tour. For our graduate student interviews, people will walk you through common areas, show you lab space. You'll get to uh, listen to somebody as they talk and walk you through campus. There will be opportunities to interact with current students. Maybe that will be over uh, meals. You know, everybody will have their uh, lunch and sit and talk. Maybe there'll be panels. Maybe there'll be small groups. Maybe there'll be breakout rooms. There's likely to be a combination of all those things. And then you will have interviews with faculty and program administrators. And as you go on interviews, please communicate with us and we'll keep updating this because we are all learning what the components are going to be. But my gut feeling is these are the four major components. Then you'll have actual interviews, which are likely to be a series of short one-on-one -on -one meetings. 
Some schools might tell you, you can schedule those whenever you'd like between this date and that date to give you flexibility. Some schools might say, you're gonna meet with this person and then they're gonna leave the Zoom room, this person's gonna show up, there'll be 10 minutes in between. But you're likely to have a series of short one-on-one -on -one meetings. It's possible, although I think less likely that there will be a lot of group interviews this year, Group interviews are multiple interviewers with you or multiple interviewers and multiple applicants or one interviewer and multiple applicants. If that's going to happen, you will know that in advance. It will say that in your schedule and then you'll want to work with someone to practice that, all right? Because interviewing in a group is a little bit different than interviewing. Uh, on your own. I'm going to take one second here. I thought I did a good job of readjusting for the sun, but I'm uh, pretty much unable to see anything because it shifted again. Ah. All right, it will be a little darker, and this is an example of uh, how not to go ahead yourself, um, but uh, that's a lot better. All right, so that's a little bit about what the interview will look like. Let's talk about setting it up. You will get both calls and emails. You want to make sure that your message on your cell phone is professional. You want to make sure uh, that your email signature is as well. Some schools think that it shows a great deal more warmth to invite you by phone. So expect some phone calls. So respond if, you, if they left a message or if you got an email, respond promptly and professionally. They will likely give you some instructions. The instructions might just be, please go to this survey and tell us what date you wanna come. There might be more instructions. They might ask you to download certain software. They might ask you um, to send a list of faculty, but read all of the instructions carefully. Don't call with questions until you've read all the instructions. It doesn't make a great impression to call with questions and have somebody say, well, in the email we sent, it said this. Now, there have been questions already in the chat box about what if interview weekends overlap? What am I going to do? What if I'm busy? So here's my thoughts about that. You should be as accommodating as possible regarding dates offered for your interview, but you also need to set healthy boundaries and pick dates that are good for you. And you need to be realistic regarding your schedule. If you have a week of finals, you do not want to be juggling a virtual interview with finals. If you have something happening in your lab that week and you really need to be present, you don't want to be trying to satisfy your PI and doing interviews, which is why I stress how important it is to have discussions with your um, PIs in advance. So you want to be accommodating, but also realistic. Two things. You can ask for time to get back to them. You can say, thank you. I'm very excited for this opportunity. I am unable to commit to this date at this moment, can I get back to you next week? That is completely appropriate to ask for more time. It is also completely appropriate to say, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Unfortunately, I already have a commitment those dates. Can I please interview on another date? Those are completely appropriate requests. Some schools might be inflexible and say no, in which case you have a decision to make, but most schools are understanding. We've worked it out when people were flying all over the country. It will be much easier to work it out virtually. So one of the silver linings of this may be that you have a lot, of, um, a lot more flexibility in schedules. It does not convey a lack of interest to ask for another uh, interview date. It conveys a lack of interest if you don't respond or if after they offer three or four dates, you keep saying, no, that doesn't work. No, that doesn't work. No, that doesn't work. 
eventually a lack of contact or multiple, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that, is going to lead a school to assume you're not interested. But to say, I'm sorry, I already have a commitment for that inter those interview dates, is it possible to interview another date? That's professional and appropriate. Now, if you apply to a long list of schools, and that's what we've, adv we've advised increasing the number given uncertainty around uh, admissions this year, it may be that a school way at the bottom of your list gets back to you early and you don't wanna commit yet because another school higher on your list put on the website the dates of their interviews. It is fine to say, can I have a week or two before I let you know, all right? It is not disrespectful to ask for flexibility. Healthy boundaries are a sign of maturity, all right? And saying no to a date you can't interview is setting a healthy boundary. You want to be sure to understand the structure of the interview and when you need to be available. And one thing I can say that has been frustrating from March till now is how many people get confused about time zones, right? So I, I've done it myself. People miss meetings with me and then they say, oh, I forgot, I got confused. People miss uh, a small group discussion. They say, I got, you know, I, I thought it was three o'clock Pacific time. You need to be really careful and know when you need to be available and translate it all into your time zone and be really on top of your game about that because that's a really avoidable stress. And then you wanna follow directions. If they say download uh, and sign on a week early to do a technology check, do it. Even if you think I'll be fine, I've done a bunch of these. Follow directions. Those are some things about setting up the interview and what to expect at the interview. So I'm gonna pause here and take questions about setting up and what to expect. And then we're gonna talk about interview questions and, and the next parts of this. So I'll pause here for a moment to see if there are any other questions about setting things up. I know there were multiple questions about flexibility and I think I probably answered all of them. Let me say one other thing about flexibility. In the moment, if you are incredibly stressed, you got an email and you like, oh, how do I respond to this? That's what we're here for. So if you're at NIH, reach out to us, okay? And quite frankly, if you're not at NIH and you need a little bit of help, you don't have someone on your campus, reach out to me. I would be delighted to help you. If they don't specify if it's a group interview, do you assume it's not? You can assume it's not. If they just have your, you know, uh, nine o'clock, Dr. So-and-so, 9.30, Dr. So-and-so, you can assume it's just you and that person. Any other questions? All right, here is the second most important first principle. The program is interviewing you. Yes, you need to make a good impression, but you are also interviewing the program and you need to keep that in mind. Your goal is to decide if this might be a good fit. And you can only do that if you tackle this whole process from this perspective that it is a two-way interview, and you are both the interviewer and the interviewee. It's really important to keep that in mind. So as a week before now, we've talked about stress management, which is starting now all the way through the whole interview season. The week before though, you wanna do some things uh, to really, some of these are more than a week before, but the rereading your application and material about the school and program, you wanna do that in the week before. You wanna make sure that you are, uh, that you remember what you wrote about, okay? That you, if you said you're interested in a school for a particular reason, that you remember to ask about that or talk about that. You also want to learn about the work of faculty you're going to meet. And I think generally this means reading some of their papers, not dozens of their papers, but um, a handful of their most recent papers. And if you have lots of interviews and you can't pull off reading multiple papers, at a minimum, read the research description on their website. Make sure that you're really familiar with what they do. 
If you are interviewing for clinical psych or biomedical engineering or computer science or any other field where you have to match with a PI at the outset, then you really do need to read multiple papers, right? So if you have rotation opportunities in the program you're interviewing with, you can get away with less paper reading. But if this is a, do we really match? Do we have research interests that really overlap? Am I gonna be able to learn what I want in this group? Then it's important to read multiple papers. Again, I talked about your virtual handshake, that leaning forward, it's nice to meet you, I'm so glad to be here, right? You wanna make sure uh, that you can calmly do that. And then you wanna practice your short, in, I call it the introduction to me. Some people call it their elevator pitch. I, I uh, especially because these are virtual, we won't be in, and elevators aren't especially safe right now. Uh, we don't spend very much time in them. I just decide to call it introduction to me. So when you get to some small group activity um, or an interview and somebody says, tell me uh, a little bit about who you are that you have practiced. Not that you sound like you've memorized it and whatever you do, do not have a script and read off of it at these interviews. You want this to be something that comes naturally. My name is Sharon Milgram and I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at the NIH or post back at the NIH. I work in the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute where I study X, Y, and Z, a short introduction. You don't wanna go on really long. If they say short, they mean two sentences, right? So you don't wanna go on and on, but you wanna have that brief introduction. You also wanna practice talking about your research, both past and present. Uh, you want to practice answering common interview questions. I'm gonna show you lots of them. You want to prepare questions in advance. Okay, so you want to, when they say, do you have any questions for me? You want to be able to answer that with, yes, I do. Thank you. Here are my questions. Sort out what you're going to wear. Make sure that it's ready. I already warned against the, uh, you know, pajama bottom and interview shirt um, and set up your interview space. And I talked about a lot of this already. There's a question about uh, will you know the people who will be interviewing you in advance? Schools should send you a list of uh, it, people who you will be meeting with in advance. They should send you a schedule in advance. Remember, they're doing the best they can in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so it may be that you only get it a few days before. Appreciate if you only get it a few days before, you can't read many, many papers because you don't know who you're going to meet with and then obviously you need to adjust. If you don't get it until the morning of, look at their websites quickly. And when you meet a faculty member, you can say, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get my schedule in advance. I didn't know we were meeting. And I would appreciate hearing a little bit about your research. So you don't need, if you don't have time, you don't need to apologize, but let them know. Right? You don't need to go into this terrible, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Just say, unfortunately, I just got my schedule and, and therefore I haven't had a chance to read your papers. And like I said, breathe into it, okay? And there's a request for some good examples of questions and I'll help you with that in a slide or two. In terms of talking about your research, I think that's the next slide. No, okay, that's gonna come up in two slides then. All right, so let's, before we talk about talking about your research, talk overall about the goals of the interview. You want to present yourself both enthusiastically and honestly. People who over embellish their accomplishments don't do well at interviews. People who won't talk about their accomplishments at all don't do well at interviews. And I love the language that uh, actually a postback introduced me to at uh, one of these workshops long ago. We were talking about imposter fears and how they get in the way of interviewing effectively. And they shared that they like to use the language of humble brag. So we wanna be humble. We want to um, convey 
really a sense that we know that we have a lot to learn. So there's humble, bragging, meaning we're willing to talk about things that have gone well or that we're proud of or happy about. And it doesn't have to be that it was perfect. Maybe you wish you got a paper, you didn't, but you presented at a meeting and that was a great experience. So you wanna present yourself honestly and enthusiastically and just keep in mind that word, that phrase, humble brag. A goal, a big goal is to show that you understand your research and the field that you're entering. And I'll have a lot to say about that in the next slide. Another goal is to clearly describe your current interests. If you are applying to a program where you can do rotations, you wanna talk about your current interests, but from the perspective that you understand that they will evolve. If you are interviewing with specific PIs and you have to commit to that PI to join that graduate program, then you want to clearly describe your current interest and show how it fits with that PI's interests. You also want to show that you have an appreciation for what a career in your field entails. And that doesn't mean everyone walking in and saying, I want to be a PI. I want to be a PI. I want to be a PI. I think there's this idea out there that that's what everyone wants to hear. So you should tell them what you want, what they want to hear. I caution you about that. First of all, some of you already know now you want to go into industry or you want to uh, combine your love of research with teaching. Some of you already know that you're heading towards um, a variety of career paths. And the second thing is that lots of students change their mind in grad school. So if you just talk very narrowly about careers and then you don't get any information about career development opportunities and the breadth of careers that students in that department head towards, then you've missed out on some important things. So you want to talk about careers and what interests you from the perspective of showing that research matters to you. But you can also say, I am interested in careers in government and in industry. I may be interested in science policy in the long term, but I know that the first step is a great research uh, experience. So you want to be thoughtful about how you convey your understanding about careers. If you have bumps in your past, you want to explain them. That bump could be a C uh, in a few courses. It could be an overall GPA that's a little bit low. It could be that you started in one lab and quickly had to leave it for whatever reason. I recommend if you have things like that that you're worried about, that you need the reality check of mentors who have served on uh, admissions committees to give you a perspective. Sometimes students come to see me and they're like, oh, I have these terrible bumps to deal with. They're really big elephants in the room. And I ask them what they are. And I'm like, I wouldn't even bring that up. And if somebody asks you about it, you know, give a short explanation and move on. I find that a lot of applicants see their record as more flawed than we see it. But if you have things you're worried about, you should reach out to mentors uh, and get advice about that. You should learn, uh, another goal for you is to learn details of the program, school, faculty, and the community. That's gonna be harder virtually, but you can ask questions about what it's like to live there. Do students mostly live on campus, off campus? What is the average cost of housing? You know, how do, how do people get to work? You wanna learn details of both the life there and education there. You want to find out if the research being done excites you. Some of you have very, very broad interests and you just want to make sure that there's a lot of possibility for you. Some of you have really precise things that you want to do and you want to make sure you can do it there. And overall, your goal is to figure out if this is the right school and life for you. And I know that that's hard to do in a quick visit, and I think it's harder to do in a quick virtual visit. So we'll talk a lot about that as we move through. So in terms of those goals, remember that preparation pays off, all right? Sometimes NIH postbacs tell me that their PI said getting into graduate school is easy. And the thing is that 20 years ago, getting into graduate school was easy relatively easy for sure, okay? 
But now there's a lot more competition. You are competing with many other people with very uh, impressive research experiences, and we expect to see students prepare. So all of the things I talked about in terms of preparation, please make sure to do them. I've had postbacks tell me, you know, I was doing important experiments, so I didn't have a lot of time to practice, and I got there, and I was a little frazzled. I hadn't read a lot. It's not likely to go well. So preparation pays off. The second correlate to remember is first impressions form quickly, and first impressions are very, very hard to change. So we know a lot about how people form first impressions, and first impressions form in a, a short amount of time. And even via Zoom, I've noticed I've met lots of new people over Zoom in the last eight months, and within the first 10 seconds, I, I um, feel like I get quite a general impression by how they greet me, whether they get all flustered. You know, it's not whether the, the volume, the audio works right away or not, it's how flustered do they get. We form first impressions pretty quickly. So the first is from your dress. And so you want to make sure that you are dressed like an interview, even if you are here uh, at your house or on your campus. Um, and you want to address appropriate for the institution and the event. And by that, I mean MD, PhD interviews are more formal than uh, PhD interviews. If there's a, a meet and greet with students the evening before, you don't have to be dressed up, okay? Most PhD programs, you don't need to wear a tie. Virtual interviews make that even more uh, of a totally true statement that you don't need to wear a tie. Um, but you want to dress up more business casual for the actual interview and more casual for any events with students or any other social kinds of events. We make first impressions or form first impressions by our posture and often our handshake, but this time it will be the confidence of our virtual presence through our eye contact and facial expressions, gestures and nervous mannerisms. One of the worst things to do is have your phone close so you keep looking down to the side. Whatever you do, don't have your phone here, but you're really talking there, okay? So eye contact and gestures. Also from our voice and tone, are we calm and talking in a, in a reasonable pace, right? And then how we organize and express ideas and our ability to listen and answer questions. Sometimes I ask someone a question and they give an answer, but it didn't answer the question. So that's a little bit about your listening skills. In these group activities, you know, like when you get together with students, I talked about speaking up and stepping back. You don't wanna be the person who dominates, but you don't wanna be the person that nobody remembers was there either. And so we make, we make impressions through all of these things, our ability to listen, respond, uh, how we, uh, whether we ramble or go slowly, uh, are we talking uh, too low, are we looking down, are we looking away, okay? Those are all the ways that we make first impressions. A few other things to remember at group activities, it is not all about you, do not dominate the discussion, but do not disengage, check your phone and check out. You're trying to connect professionally and personally. That will be even a little bit harder than in person, I think. It will be uh, somewhat challenging. That may mean a few minutes of asking how people are dealing with the pandemic, you sharing without going into too many details how you've been dealing with the pandemic. I think we all should expect questions like, uh, have you been able to get much work done? How is, how is all of this going for you? Um, Right, there might be a lot of questions uh, personally around that. Again, you want to remember boundaries and you do not want to give too much information. Too much information would be to go into a lot of detail about something. If you say, it's been really rough, I live alone and we quarantined for three months, that was a rough three months, that is an appropriate amount. If you start going into all kinds of details about it, then it's not. If there are social drop-in Zoom activities, they are a part of the interview and you should make every effort to be there and to participate. 
and then you must have questions when asked. And that's in individual meetings with faculty, that's during any talks, and if they do virtual posters. If students present virtual posters and you go, you want to put a question into the chat or ask it and do not do it as anonymous. Own your questions. It is fine to ask about social life and non-school activities, and that's really important. I mean, you need to know what it's gonna be like to be there, but you want to make sure that you're also asking more academic and research-oriented questions. And one strategy I always tell people, lead with those, right? First impressions form quickly. Lead with some great questions about research at the university and courses and, and um, students writing grants, papers, and then say, and I'd like to hear about uh, to, uh, most students' social life. I'd like to understand a little bit about how students uh, take care of themselves. All right, so it's okay to ask both, but start with more academic ones. Now I'm going to talk about some things about your research. I said I was going to do that, and then there were multiple slides in between. All right, so it's really important to think of your research in two ways, the big picture and the details, or the forest and the trees. That means that you can talk about why you're doing what you're doing and how you're doing it. You need to be able to do both. It is most likely that you will have to talk about what you're doing now, but it is also possible if you wrote about it in an essay that you'll have to talk about something you did a few years back. And that's why I reminded you to practice that. I think that you should be clear about how COVID impacted your progress. You can say, I was not uh, in lab for three months. Uh, I learned R at that time. I wasn't in lab for three months. We worked on a review paper. I wasn't in lab for the entire semester or the summer because of COVID, but I participated in virtual internships. You should just be matter of fact and clear. Just don't get caught in a negative space about it. And if somebody else says, oh, well, I was in a COVID lab and I was working, understand that we fully understand that some of you weren't able to go in and you were doing your part of this public, of dealing with this public health issue. So nobody's gonna look at you negatively because you were at home while somebody else was working. So you should be matter of fact and clear about how COVID impacted your progress. And you might talk about what you learned during that time, right? What activities you participated in um, and what you learned. You'll want to modify your responses about your research based on whether the listener is an expert or a non-expert. So if you're interviewing to join someone's lab, right, it's a clinical psych interview or a program where there are no rotations, well, then you're talking to somebody whose lab you might want to join for the most part, and you're going you're, you're gonna to dive deeper and give much more in-depth answers. If you're talking to a non-expert, you're going to start with an introduction that explains the area. And if you're unsure, you can say, would you like me to briefly introduce things or just dive into my experiments? And somebody will say, oh, I know a lot about, I know a lot about that. Uh, or they might say, oh, I don't know anything. I'd like to hear the introduction. It's okay for you to ask for that guidance. If they ask you questions about uh, communication or how you deal with, uh, you know, setback in the lab, it's much better to use stories uh, to show rather than just tell. So students will say things like, I've developed excellent communication skills. And I'd much rather hear them say, I've presented um, at uh, several journal clubs and at poster sessions on campus. And I went to a meeting where I also presented my work. I feel like I've developed a strong presentation skills through those experiences. That's so much more valuable. So show rather than tell. And often students say that they wanna bring a PowerPoint with some uh, data. I think it's uh, difficult in this case to rely on props because you might not be able to share your screen easily or at all, or it might get really complex and then you practice and you can't do it. 
I am not a big fan of it anyway. I think that it makes it a lot harder to engage with people. But I think this year I'm even less uh, enthused about having props. Now there's a caveat. If they tell you come prepared with one slide to explain your research, and I think some schools might do something like that, or you're gonna get to give a 10 minute talk, um, no slides allowed, or you're gonna get to give a 10 minute talk, two slides allowed, whatever they tell you, then obviously you wanna practice that talk again and again, and then bringing your slide makes really good sense. If they ask you to send that slide in advance, send it in advance, don't make it really complex and animated because you might not be the one showing it and then say, next slide, hit it again, hit it again. Nope, you hit it twice, back up, that doesn't work. All right, so that's some things about interviewing. Another set of interviewing successfully um, bullets, you wanna make sure to ask questions about science and about the program. You want to ask questions to both students and faculty. You want to ask questions about their research. Okay. So when they present to you about their science and they say, do you have any questions? Don't jump right away to questions about the program. Ask them something about their science first, and then you can ask other things. And it's okay to say, that's really outside my field. Can you give me a sense of where this research might head next? Or can you help me understand this technique? You do not have to be an expert. Don't pretend that you are. You want to use both your, your questions and your answers and your interactions to show that you're enthusiastic, realistic, and hardworking. But again, remember that idea of also presenting yourself uh, in a humble, kind way. And if you have any poor grades or blemishes on your record, you'll want to practice how to accept those gracefully. You want to think that through in advance. Um, I sometimes say, I can't believe somebody will ask you about that one C on your really great record, and then somebody will, and so you want to have thought it through. And then I'm going to go all the way back, full circle, to the beginning. You need to have strategies for dealing with the nervousness and stress. So you want to practice some of your deep breathing techniques. You want to have some healthy snacks right there. You want to have water close by so that you don't have to get up and run in the middle. Um, a lot of students have a mantra that really helps. It is what it is. I can do this. I've done hard things before. You could have a mantra. Some people have an, uh, a go-to object. You don't want to fidget and have it be visible or be really distracted by it. But if there's something that makes you feel good, have it set up in the room. When I lecture, in part to help me with energy, but in part because it's been hard to be on Zoom lecturing so much, I have this whole wall of pictures from a family. My son is right there. Uh, you know, Even though he's in LA, he's right there smiling at me. So whatever mantra or object that can help you refocus, make sure it's there. And if they give you a break, get up and move. Do not doom scroll on your phone and sit. Get up, get outside, take a deep breath, move a little bit, stretch, all right? Because it can be a very, very long day to interview on Zoom. So, I wanted to talk a little bit about things that we might ask you, okay? And we're not going to go through these one by one here, um, but if you join the OITE small group uh, interviews, which anyone who is currently at NIH can do, then we'll practice some of these questions. If you're not at NIH and you don't have somewhere to practice, reach out to me and I'll help you figure it out. I would be delighted to help. You need to look at all of these and have thought them through. Tell me about yourself is not about your childhood, where you were born. It's about yourself academically. You might, there might be something personally that really impacts your academic decisions and you can mention that, but tell me about yourself is not, I was born in Philadelphia and I grew up, I went to this, uh, high school, et cetera. It's sort of tell me about your research and academic self. Tell me about your previous research experience. Is a chance for you to pick and talk about an experience you're really excited about. 
now generally we expect you to talk about what you're doing right now but you know if you had a summer experience that totally totally changed the way you see things and what you decided to do you can say if it's okay with you i'm going to talk about my summer experience two years ago because it really impacted my decision to do epidemiology and then go ahead so you if they say tell me about your previous experience you get to choose which they might say tell me about your nih post back experience in which case you don't get to pick what do you enjoy most about doing research? What don't you enjoy? Do not tell us you love everything. Nobody loves everything about any, anything. Be realistic about what you love about it and what you sometimes struggle with. Sometimes people think you're supposed to turn that into a, a, into a positive, right? Uh, well, I really don't like the repetition, but I've worked on that and now I can sit and do an experiment five times in a row. So a better answer would be, to be honest, sometimes I find an element of lab work repetitious, but I remind myself of the excitement of getting good data or, or really confirming results, and that's helpful. I think you will get a lot of how has the pandemic influenced your research experiences. This is not to make you feel bad. It's to give the interviewers insight into how uh, you've been, uh, what you've been up to and, and helping us keep that in mind. What types of scientific problems, what approaches, these are things to see, have you thought through what you might do. Those of you who are not sure, you're open to multiple model systems, you know you wanna do disease-related research, but it could be in multiple organs, all kinds of different things, it's okay to say that. I know I wanna use genetic approaches, or I know I wanna use animal models, but I'm open to a variety of different scientific questions but we want some sense of what you're thinking about. Why do you think you're ready for graduate school? We are not just trying to get at research, that's communication skills. More and more, that's your resilience and wellness skills. I know I probably talk about wellness more than many of you care to hear, but I do that because the data show that graduate students are more sixfold more likely to be uh, experiencing symptoms of depression and anxiety than the broader population. That says the stress of graduate school and the stress of research environments take a toll on people. So people will ask you, when they say, why do you think you're ready? They might ask you about your stress management. They might ask you about your resilience. How do you deal with setback? How, do, how are you learning to be more resilient? So it's not just when they say, why do you think you're ready? It's not just research it's communication, it's resilience, it's teamwork, interpersonal skills, et cetera. They will want to know why you are interested in their program, and if you're interviewing with a particular PI who interests you, he or she might say, and why my group, why did you ask to meet with me? And then that uh, question I've talked about many times about a uh, blemish on your record. Some more about your career, why you wanna be a scientist, People might be sort of negative and say, it's such a hard path, do you really wanna do this? And we're not looking for a Pollyanna, I just love it and I wanna do it. We're looking for a thoughtful question. Why, why are you doing this? What are your career goals? You might get questions about strengths and weaknesses. That, again, do not turn your weakness into a heroic uh, you know, effort to change it. Be realistic and say how you're working on it and then et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole lot more questions here. I don't know which of these you will be asked. You might be asked questions that aren't on this list, but if you spend time thoughtfully thinking about this list, I think you will be ready to pivot if you get another question that's not on this list. You can also talk to your friends about questions they've gotten. I want to make one big point. The idea is not to prepare an answer for each of these that sort of, you know, you hit the button and spit out. The goal is for you to have thought deeply about these so that you can um, easily begin to discuss it. So if you haven't thought about how you deal with research setbacks and disappointments, then you're, you're not going to be able to um, come up with something in the moment. But if you've thought about it, then it's not gonna be a hard question. 
I think there might be some things about how you relax and what you've read. That happens more often in professional school interviews, but more and more scientists are appreciating that we need to focus a little bit more on wellness and healthy work-life boundaries. And so you might get some questions about things in your personal life. My favorite question is the bottom one. Is there anything you wish I had asked you? That is your chance to humble brag. You know, I, I wish you had asked me about my summer experience three summers ago. Here's something about that. I was the, this was my first lab experience and I was really in an intense lab and here's what I learned and it really made me uh, realize I wanted to do this. All right, that's your chance to bring up things that you're proud of that they didn't ask you about. Do not bring up, if you get that question and nobody asked you about your bad grade, don't say, yeah, you should have asked me about my C in chemistry. It means that they don't care about it. Also, one thing to realize is some interviewers don't get to see your transcript because we think it biases them, right? Confirmation, confirmation bias really gets in the way. If we come in thinking this is a a uh, less strong student, then we look for data that it's a less strong student and that in, imposes bias into the, into the interview. If we come in, oh, this person had a 4.0 and they give us a lousy answer, we think it's better because we saw their GPA. So some people will not know your GPAs. They will not have seen much about your record. Do not assume that they read it carefully, okay? Some people will ask behavioral questions. Those are like, describe a time when you had difficulty working with uh, a co-worker or a supervisor. Tell me about a time you had to juggle and keep track of multiple projects. Tell me about a time you failed to meet a deadline. Tell me about a time you had a conflict with your PI. All right. Those are called behavioral questions. The reason we ask them is past behavior is a good indication of future behavior. And so if you say, I didn't know how to resolve that conflict, so I went and got advice, then we're listening and we say, oh, so if they have a problem here, they might come and get advice, <laughs> all right? So we are looking to see what you did in the past as an indicator of how you will behave in the future. To prepare for these types of questions, you just wanna do some self-reflection in advance, you want to use this SAR approach, situation, action, result. You want to explain what happened. You want to explain what you did in response. And you want to talk about how it worked out in the end. And you want to practice that. It does not come naturally to people. And I suggest because it's much better to give examples out of the research space that you focus your reflection on preparing for these on interactions around you in the research space or in the academic space. Sometimes people will give an example from a club or from something in the community or from a sports team, and they might answer the question pretty well, but they're farther away from the space we care about. You should not only expect behavioral questions. You may not get very many of these at all. I put it in there because we're seeing more and more of them as schools try to find people with the resilience and the emotional intelligence to thrive in graduate school. We're looking for people who have the ability to develop their assertiveness skills because we know that environments can be hard. So more and more we're asking these questions, but still there will be an awful lot of tell me about your research and I'm going to tell you about mine. And then there's what you might ask, right? And I want you to spend a moment, I'll give you these slides, but I really want you to think about this. A part of me wanted to take out the next slides because each of you is different and unique and you want to ask different things. And so promise me that you will not just go right to these slides of the things that you might ask but that you'll really look at this list from the perspective of what you really need to know. You might get to talk to students who are in a lab that you are interested in. That's great because you could ask questions more about that research group. You might be asking general questions about the program. If you are interviewing 
in programs where you have to match with the lab immediately at the outset to get into the program, then I encourage you to watch my video on uh, finding mentors, finding your research home before you go out on interviews because you need to ask about the science but also their mentorship and management and other things. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind. So you wanna ask all kinds of questions about whether it's a supportive community, how do people find labs, what happens if a mentor you wanna work with does not have funding, how do students publish? Do they go to meetings? Are there travel awards? All kinds of questions, all right? The more questions you have and the more people you ask similar questions, the more accurate impression you will get of the experience. If you just ask one question of each person, then you're not, you might not get enough questions answered. You don't want to hog the, remember, it's not only about you. So in group activities, you don't want to put 10 questions out there, but you don't want to sit quietly and not put any questions. And every one-on-one -on -one interaction, when they say, do you have questions for me? You should make sure to ask some questions. I would ask, I would ask you to consider asking two questions. And one is what happens if a student needs to change groups? Because you want to get a sense of how much people will take care of you. And the other is, how has the pandemic changed your graduate program? You know, we all say this has changed all of us forever. And then we say, let's hope some of that changes for the good. So maybe the program has started doing more mentor training. Maybe the program has started holding more community support events. Maybe the community has responded to all of the examples of systemic racism in our community with trainings and change. Maybe the community, maybe the school has started a social justice initiative. You wanna know how this experience has changed people in that program and changed the program itself. It gives you some insight into the program. A few things to avoid, and then I think we're almost gonna wrap up and I see a lot of questions and it'll be fun to answer them. Do not badmouth other schools or programs. Do not talk too much about other schools. I still remember, and it's probably 20 years ago, maybe even more than 20 years ago. I was at UNC and somebody came and all they talked about was Wisconsin. And so we said, good, go to Wisconsin. And we didn't make an offer. So don't talk too much about other schools. Even if this school is not your first choice, you're like a guest in their virtual house. And so be courteous. Do not forget to thank each interviewer at the end. And just like there's a virtual handshake at the beginning, it's really nice to meet you. Same thing, lean forward, look into the camera. Thank you, I really appreciated a chance to talk. <coughs> Do not skip Zoom social events to study, to visit friends. Uh, well, that, I'm sorry, that's from uh, when, when they were in person and you were in another town. Don't skip Zoom social events to do other things. Let me leave it at that. I think it's important to get a sense of the program. And so I think those social events are important. If it's awkward and everybody's just sitting and looking at each other, then they haven't been doing these a lot, right? And that means the school hasn't really supported their students through the pandemic. Do not check email and answer your phone while in Zoom meetings. Close all notifications on your laptop so you don't have your Instagram pinging, your email pinging. Shut all of that off on both your phone and your laptop. And don't arrive late for interviews and activities. Those are all behaviors you wanna try to avoid. After the interview, you should send thank you emails to the program director or the program administrator. If you had a virtual student host, you'll want to thank them as well. You can mail cards, but it is not necessary. Um, and at this point, uh, some people aren't even in their office to get those cards. So I think email is a much better choice this year. You should acknowledge any offer you get with a prompt thank you. And you should ask when the program needs a firm commitment. You should not get pressured into saying yes too soon, especially I think this year, given the fact that if things go well with vaccines and 
we are on track to start moving about the cabin a little bit more, you might be able to visit campuses uh, in the late spring and that might help you with decisions. For some of you, you might not need to visit, you might know that town and you might be certain it's where you wanna go. There might be family reasons why you wanna go there. There, you know, you might be ready to say yes without visiting, but for some of you, the chance to visit might be really important. And I think many of us are holding out hope that we'll be able to offer people we accept a chance to come and see us in the late spring. You should not hesitate to email them with questions or ask for another Zoom meeting. It's hard to make a decision. It's hard to make a decision when you get to visit campuses. It is even harder to make a decision without. And I think that you need to honor that for yourself and ask as many questions and talk to people as much as you need to. You don't want to be a pain in the ass, but you also want to be, be sure you're getting the information you want. And, and you can be courteous and still ask a lot of questions, right? You just maybe need to set up another time. You'll want to be flexible about doing it when it works for them. I encourage you uh, to. Uh, take the time you need to make a good decision. And so I just want to remind you to plan all of this wisely to minimize stress and distraction. Have your questions in advance. Remember that humble brag, so be self-confident but not egotistical. If you need feedback on that, practice with people. The career counselors at your campus, the career counselors in OITE, your mentors, people who have uh, you've worked with in the past who offer to help. Uh, you're being interviewed even when you are not in formal interviews. So if there's a social event and we can see that you are looking down the whole time, we know you're not very interested. So remember that. Be careful about ends of one. If you talk to somebody who tells you they love the school and they go on and they say it's just perfect, make sure you ask some other people because an end of one doesn't mean a lot, or a, a student who's not happy at the school. There's gonna be unhappy people at every school. So you wanna get consensus. You wanna talk to enough people. You wanna pay attention to whether you feel comfortable with the current graduate students and other interviewees. That's about work and science, but it's also about identity and being able to show up as our whole selves. We want to work in a place that sees us and values us for who we are. We don't want to feel on the outside when we should be a part of the community. And so pay attention to things be beyond the science. Will I be welcomed here? Is this an environment trying to learn to be as supportive and welcoming as possible? You know, we all come into the world with our own views and lenses, and unfortunately, bias impacts all of us. But some people are working to see their biases and learn from them and other people are ignoring them. And a part of asking you if you would fit in is, is this an environment growing and learning in that way? Take some notes right afterward. Your memory will fade. If you love to journal, journal about your visit, what was exciting, what wasn't exciting. So the most important final thought is where I started. This is a stressful and emotional process. And you are gonna go through this in a stressful and emotional time. And I think that the holidays will be hard, the winter will be hard. Right now, COVID is just surging all around us. And these are really scary times. So you need to really take care of yourself. And I hope that those of you at NIH will read some of our emails about drop-in groups and uh, affinity group meetings and, and ways to deal with your stress and, and join and participate. Those of you outside NIH, you are welcome to our resilience series. That's for people at NIH and outside of NIH. I think it's critically important that you find support. You know, I'm gonna end um, by saying something that I really genuinely mean. So I've been doing this job for a really long time. And I talk to faculty members at universities all across the country. And people have a deep respect for NIH postbacs. And so those of you who are here as postbacs, you should know that schools are excited to hear from you. Those of you outside at universities across the country, at postbacs outside of NIH, I, I am confident that that same interest in engaging with you and interviewing you 
uh, exists for you as well. You know, one thing that we are really learning through the pandemic is how remarkable the young people are. I, we saw that in the election and we saw that in the Black Lives Matter movement. We see that in so many things. And so remember that uh, you bring a lot to the table and uh, go into these interviews with a sense of pride, knowing that it's a hard time, uh, but also a really special time. Graduate school interviews are the beginning of a journey of a lifetime. And so I wish you uh, a change in that word, do, uh, word uh, thing at the start. I can't, the word just escaped me, that it's not stress and anxiety that are the largest two words there, it's opportunity and a chance to shine. There are a bunch of helpful videos on the OITE YouTube page, what grad students say about grad school, what admission directors really think. There's lots of things about uh, uh, from our resilience and wellness program. So with that, I am going to dive into questions. Um, if there, uh, the first is, can I ask questions to grad students from a lab I'm interested in? If they are available, that's easy. If they're not available and it's a program that allows rotations, you could wait and do it later. If it feels important to you, you can most certainly ask uh, and set something up later. If we are interviewing with multiple PIs who have divergence in their research, how can we present ourselves as being committed to their work while acknowledging our interest in the work of others? Well, that's what an interview is right i mean uh, they all know that if you are interviewing where with a program where you have to pick someone at the end of the interview to move forward then they know you're comparing uh five related or four related um uh possibilities and so in the moment you talk about their work and your interest in their work you don't tell everyone you're my top choice because they will talk to each other but if you're particularly excited, you might say that. I'm interviewing with multiple people. This work really excites me and here's why. If it's a program that allows rotations, then there's no worry and you can have very broad uh, uh, interviews and nobody's gonna think anything of it. If there is a long and multiple part question, I sometimes forget part of the question as I'm answering it. Is it okay to ask them to repeat the question or part of the question? It is absolutely okay. That is a completely human thing to do. However, generally, when people ask a multi-part question, they usually are satisfied with the beginning. So you answer that part and then you can pause and say, I think there was another part to the question. They might say, oh, we're fine, move on. And they might say, yes, I wanted to know this but it is absolutely fine. It will not look unprofessional. What looks unprofessional is to pretend you understood when you don't or pretend that you remember or you don't. One thing I forgot to say, I don't know why it popped into my head right now. Um, make sure to change your screen uh, to your first name. If they have a particular thing that they want you to um, do first and last, do that. Uh, whatever you feel comfortable with. If you wish to put your pronouns on, that's absolutely fine as well. Um, and as you're answering questions, um, oh, I know why it came into my head because we're talking about unprofessional. You know, if you can't remember somebody's name and it's not in their Zoom box, you might say, I'm sorry, doctor, um, I, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but you had asked uh, another part to the question. That's why it popped into my head. It's not totally related, but not unrelated. In group interviews, do you answer in a circle or are questions unique to each member of the group? Usually um, there is a question and uh, it's directed towards multiple people in the group. So it'll be, why don't you start now? So in uh, Alexis, you go, now Lauren, uh, now Michael, now uh, Jamal, okay? But I don't think you're gonna have a lot of questions like that. What you might have though are three PIs that you're talking with. So for example, at NIH, the Johns Hopkins uh, program does that. I don't know what they're gonna do this year, but that's what they normally do. So there are three PIs. And so as you're answering, you, uh, you know, in this case, there's, you're just talking to all three of them, even though one of them asked a question. 
What is a good response if an interviewer asks why you had a C grade in a class? Well, I got to answer that one a couple of times. Um, a good response is I was, um, I took a really heavy load and I hadn't quite developed my study skills yet. A bad answer is, well, the teacher wasn't very good. Um, a good answer could be in the middle of the semester, I had a family emergency, I got behind and I really struggled to catch up. Those are when there's a, a, a reason. It could be that you just struggled and you could say, well, to be honest, chemistry was difficult for me in college. I feel that I've grown because I use a lot of chemistry in the lab, but I, I struggled with that. Maybe you hadn't, you weren't good about going to get help. Those are the kinds of things that are good answers to that. Is an, inter is an interview an appropriate time to ask questions to faculty about their mentorship style, lab expectations, to see if the lab is a good fit, or should those kinds of conversations happen only after acceptance? People answer that differently. I personally think if you're going to do rotations, that you don't need to do anything much about picking a lab uh, at, this inter at this early stage. But if you have really narrow interests and you desperately want to talk to somebody, it's fair to ask them about, do you have a lot of graduate students? What's your general philosophy? So I personally say, no, it's not a big part of it. If you want to ask a little bit, that's fine. Some people think that you should go to interviews really looking for rotations. I just happen to not fall in that category. So some people might tell you, yes, you should ask a lot of questions like that. Where it's critically important to ask a lot of questions like that is a, if you have to pick a lab right away. So to get into the program, you have to match with somebody. Then you want to ask some of those questions. How much should our interview answers overlap with what we've communicated in our statement? Should we expect interviewers to have already read our application? Um, it should not sound like you memorized what you wrote, but it should overlap and you should not uh, expect people to have read it. And if they read it, they might have skimmed it and they might not have even had it to read. So, um, or parts of it to read. So you should not ex expect that they're experts in your written material. How would you go about talking about a conflict with a PI without speaking poorly of them? So I guess I'm gonna preface that by saying conflict is not always a negative thing and it doesn't mean anybody is negative. Sometimes we just see things in a different way. And so what you would do is say, my PI thought this, I thought that, we disagreed about that and here's how we worked it out. And think about that and if you really struggle with it and, and need some more insight, let me know and, and we can communicate by email. Is it okay to write down the questions you want to ask or should they be memorized? It's absolutely, you should have a notepad near you. You can have your list of questions. You just do not want to be looking down the entire time. Imagine if I had done this whole two hours looking down and you got to see um, you know, the top of my head. It wouldn't be as interesting as me trying to engage even though we're all in different places, right? So it's okay to write it down, but don't look at it nonstop. I hear that I follow along here is about taking notes during the interview. I'm not sure there's a lot you need to take notes about, right? I mean, if somebody's talking about their research, it's not like you need to write down details about it because you're not going to join their lab. Possibly you're never going to join their lab and it's certainly going to be a long time away. I'm not convinced actually that you need a lot of notes. And I think if you want some sort of general memories about what they've said, you might do it in between interviews, but not do too much note taking in the moment. And that a little bit unique, some people take a lot of notes. Uh, it's a calming thing, but you do not wanna be looking down. So you should practice interviewing without taking a whole lot of notes. When you ask about the mentorship communication style of a mentor, is it best to ask that to the mentor or to the students who work with them? Again, I'm not sure you need to do this at the interview, but eventually you do need to find a supportive lab and you should ask both mentor and people in the group. <laughs> if the mentor says, well, I'm always available and you ask the students, how often do you meet? And you hear, oh, about every six weeks. You gotta ask yourself what always available means. 
So I suggest asking on both sides. And for those of you looking now for information on how to find a mentor, I really would, on our website is those rotating banners. And one of them says, mentoring matters. It has a blue background and it takes you to a YouTube video on choosing uh, research mentors. What do you say if they ask what other schools you're applying to? You answer. You uh, tell them uh, a list of schools. If they ask you what schools you're interviewing uh, for, if you have a list to tell them, tell them. If you don't, it's a little bit of an awkward question. You don't want to imply you're not a good applicant, so say, I haven't heard from a lot of them yet. Um, but if people ask you what schools you've applied to, tell them. They're not asking in a nefarious way. They just want a sense of where else you're thinking about. Don't read too much into that. What's the admissions committee's thought process when deciding to admit one applicant over another? A combination of what we saw in the application. If you got an interview, it means we're interested in you. So it sort of resets everything. But sometimes, you know, somebody will say they interviewed well and boy, I loved their essay or they had a great letter. But in general, it's how what we're looking for is who talked about science really well who was able to engage with the students and faculty. Some of that will be harder for us to judge this year. And so I think we will be relying a lot on, you know, if we had two faculty give talks, did students ask questions? Who asked questions in our informational sessions with faculty? Who was able to engage with the faculty and talk about both their work and the faculty's work? So I think it's a combination of things. What will the interviewers think if the applicant doesn't have the strongest GPA but has a very extensive post back? So some people will worry about the GPA. Some people will say the GPA doesn't matter at all anymore. Everybody has a different opinion about that. If you got an interview, it means they want to see uh, you in person, virtual person, and they want to get a sense of uh, your strengths. And so you should not carry that GPA through the entire interview process as a heavy weight, but you'll want to be ready to discuss it if they uh, ask you about it. Is it okay to take notes? I talked about that a little bit. Yes, it's okay, but I encourage you not to take too many notes unless you have some really compelling need to take notes. Can you suggest creative ways to get a feel for lab environments given that visits may not be allowed? More so than just reviewing the research and talking to current students. Yeah, I um, so I think talking to current students gives you a lot. You know, we've hired some people during the pandemic in the OITE, and I encourage them to talk to lots of different people. I also encourage them uh, to set up group meetings where you can watch people interact. I think if you are needing to decide in a school and you're not going to get to visit and you need to decide a PI in advance, you might ask if you could attend lab meetings or a journal club. That might give you a little bit more of a assessment. You should ask multiple questions of multiple people. Not do you like it, but can you tell me about, you should ask more behavioral like questions. What happens when the PI gets stressed? What happens when the PI gets frustrated with somebody? Who gets to go to meetings? How do people decide? You should ask really specific questions. If you get to rotate, then I think all of this can wait and we will be out of this at some point and you will get a chance to go and do rotations. And so I wouldn't worry about it too much if it's a rotation-based system. Is it really important to look into the camera? What would you recommend to develop the habit of looking more into the camera? So um, I finally noticed that the camera has a green light. That's what helps me look into it. I have... Uh, somebody who told me that they put a uh, arrow, a piece of uh, sticky tape and an arrow next to their camera. The best thing is to make sure that the height of your chair and the height of your computer sets you up for success in all of that. The second thing to remember is it's imperfect and you are human and it is really weird to do this all via a computer. So you won't always look into the camera. So setting things up, uh, really helps as well. So making sure that you, uh, your chair and computer are set up right. Um, 
and that's it. A reminder, you know where to look and you set it up to make that easy. And it's not important to look into the camera at every minute. At the end of the interview, should you leave first or wait until the interviewer leaves? You know, that's a good question. And I, I wonder how many will open a room and have multiple people just show up in the same room. So they'll have someone in the waiting room, in which case you need to leave, right? And so at the end, you'll lean forward and say, thank you so much for the opportunity to interview. I appreciated talking with you. And then uh, you'll just uh, hit leave the meeting, right? It might be that they say, okay, and then they hit uh, remove from the meeting. I wouldn't worry about it. It won't be awkward. I think it'll be pretty obvious. If we have two screens, we should, should we be looking into the screen that the camera is on? I think you need to ask yourself if you if there's a benefit to having two screens or if that's going to be a distraction and you should practice with two screens. I um you know and I got a second I got a big monitor because I've been on this laptop for so long and then I set it up and it was distracting and I found I was talking to trainees or PIs or NIH folks and I wasn't, I was confused where to look suddenly. So I got rid of it. So you should practice with two screens and decide. Pro tip, I've heard of people using googly eyes next to the camera to maintain eye contact. Thank you for sharing that. So I guess uh, that's the equivalent of the arrow, but a little bit more uh, whimsical and fun. So put a sticker up of two eyes. You know, I actually think part of the reason I have those pictures behind me um, is that it helps me look at the camera because when I look up for the pictures, I am exactly looking at the right height for the camera. For the interview, is it okay if I interview from my desk in the lab or the background can be distracting? Actually, I think I didn't talk enough about, I said pick the right place, but I didn't talk about that. I think lab backgrounds can be very distracting. What is also distracting there is people coming behind you. So if you, and I think lab is too noisy. So I think you want to find a quiet room if at all possible. If you uh, interview at home, um, you know, I've seen, I've been in meetings where the person I'm talking to is dressed, but the person moving behind is not dressed appropriately. And I just ignore it, right? But you don't necessarily want that to happen. So if the desk in lab is your best place, talk to everybody, find out if they imagine that that can work and use a virtual background, but test that you don't get lost into that virtual background. Some of the NIH virtual backgrounds are quite nice, but, um, what would be ideal is if you get a quiet room, if your PI can assign you an office for that day, if your the PI can't, maybe someone in your training office can help you. What if your pet interrupts? I think you've all heard Teo, it is what it is, smile and apologize and don't worry about it. I have also heard of clipping a ring light around your camera to help maintain eye contact and have good lighting. I actually think that's another good point. Um, if you're really struggling with the lighting, you might want to look uh, into that. I live in an area with a lot of sirens that are unpredictable. Would you recommend addressing this at the beginning of the interview? I, um, I think you could go either way, whatever decreases your stress. If it decreases your stress to say, I just want to let you know I live near a hospital and there's an awful lot of sirens, then good. If that doesn't decrease your stress, when it happens, just pause. Don't try to talk over the siren, just pause. You are not responsible for sirens, just like you're not responsible for IT problems. And so um, just pause and then go on. If you're using Zoom, I like to minimize the speakers window and, sp and place the mini speakers right below the camera. It feels more natural. I can see them, but the picture is so close to the camera that it looks like I'm looking into the camera. Yeah, you know, thank you for that. That's another strategy that some people use. I struggled with that, so I moved them totally uh, out of the way. And that's, again, why I started with the best way to deal with the stress of all of this is to practice a lot. If you do multiple mock interviews with people, you can try different ways of doing it, right? And so um, that's a suggestion here is, is to use the mini speaker view. 
Thank you for sharing that. My spouse and I are both applying to grad school. We have different timelines. It would be best if I could put off my grad school decision as long as possible so she has time to interview. How long can I reasonably put off committing? Grad schools sign an agreement to give students till April 15th. Not every grad school honors that, but a lot of grad schools will give students till April 15th. MD, PhD, I think is May 15th, actually. Um, you should be honest when you get offers about what's happening in your life and hopefully programs will understand. I also think because of COVID, we need to give people time because ideally it will be safe to travel very, very soon uh, after. I mean, it's definitely not safe in February and March, so you wanna do these interviews virtually, but maybe it will be safe to travel in April or May. Maybe it won't. And then you all have to think through another set of decisions without visiting, but maybe it will. And so I think schools need to give you some time. So my gut feeling is that will work out okay. Be clear and direct about it. So I have cleared the questions. It is 3.56. There is some daylight. Um, I'm going to go outside. I encourage all of you to do the same. And I can't stress enough how much we are here in the OITE to support you. Whether you are here at NIH or not, we want to be supportive. So please reach out. Stay safe. These um, There's hard decisions to make about travel and seeing family over the holidays. And I wish all of you a really safe uh, and, uh, and relaxing holiday, whether you get to be with uh, those you had hoped to be with or not. Reach out anytime. Thank you all.